the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the single greatest event in human history. But there is a truth that is even more profound than the fact of his resurrection. And that is that he himself is the resurrection and the life. It is one thing to know and believe that Jesus rose from the dead. It is another to know that he embodies the very essence of resurrection and eternal life. And every year on Easter Sunday, we focus on his resurrection, and rightly so. But we often fail to understand him as the resurrection and the life. And so this year I decided that we would go to that passage of scripture that declares this truth. And instead of going to the texts that describe his actual resurrection, I want us to go to this text that descri- describes what happened earlier in the resurrection of Lazarus that really laid the theological groundwork for the significance of Jesus' resurrection. Resurrection really has no meaning apart from the background of death, and it is in John 11 that we see this vital connection. Of course, death has been the greatest enemy of man since the fall, and one of the most troubling aspects of death is the fact that men often have no control over it. We're told in Ecclesiastes that just as no man has authority to restrain the wind, so no one has authority over the day of his death. And in poetic fashion, in the book of Job tells us that on the day of, of a man's death, he is torn from the security of his tent and they march him before the king of terrors. That is a poetic description of the fear of death that comes upon many. It is a sobering reality that death could come for any one of us at any moment. And the Bible often emphasizes the brevity of this earthly life. But that is why it is so critical for us to understand Jesus as the resurrection and the life. The wonderful truth of Scripture is that death is not the end for those who are in Christ Jesus. And death can be faced without any fear whatsoever because he has conquered death forever. We all know that there are no U-Hauls behind hearses and that we can take nothing with us when we die. And yet, tragically, many people spend their entire lives seeking to accumulate possessions that are snatched from them in an instant. But as believers in Jesus Christ, we are sending those eternal possessions ahead of us to heaven. And for us, Death will be the beginning of an eternity in the presence of our Lord. And that is what we see in this passage of Scripture. Now, John 11 gives the account of the raising of Lazarus from the dead. It is one of Jesus' greatest miracles and is the miracle that lays the groundwork for his own resurrection from the dead. As we pick up the narrative in John 11, Jesus is very near the cross. The religious leaders of Israel have their searchlights out and they're looking for an opportunity to put him to death. Now the purpose for John's gospel is to present Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah of God. And he has done this by providing evidence in three forms. One, by what Jesus has said about himself. Two, by what others have said about him. And three, by showing his works or the signs that Jesus performed. And here in John 11, we have the greatest of his miracles, 
apart from his own resurrection from the dead. This is one of the greatest proofs of his person as the Christ. And this miracle sets him apart from all others. Now, some might point to a couple of the Old Testament prophets who were involved in resurrections as well. Elijah, of course, raised up a widow's son in 1 Kings 17, and Elisha raised up the son of the Shulamite woman in 2 Kings chapter 4. We also know that this is not the first time that Jesus himself has raised someone from the dead. In Luke chapter 8, he raised Jairus' daughter. And in the previous chapter, he raised up a widow's son. In fact, the truth of the matter is that Jesus broke up every funeral he ever attended by raising the corpse. So someone might ask, what is so special about the raising of Lazarus? The uniqueness of this miracle is that Lazarus had been dead for four days when Jesus raised him up. He had already begun the process of decay. So this is an amazing miracle that teaches us something very important about who he is. And we'll see this in five parts this morning. We begin with the plea. In verses one through six, we're told that Lazarus, someone whom Jesus loves, is very sick, and his two sisters, whom he also loves, send word to him, expecting that he's going to drop everything and hurry to his bedside immediately and heal him of his sickness. Now, we're not going to go through those six verses this morning, but the important thing to note is that verse 4 is part of the message that he sends back to them. It says, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Some people think that verse 4 is something Jesus told to his disciples. But this is part of the response that he sends back to them through a messenger. How do we know that? <clears throat> because he later says in verse 40, did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? But all this communication back and forth was done uh, through messengers. They couldn't very well uh, call him on his cell phone or send him an email they had to send a messenger, and then the messenger had to go back to them uh, with the message, and it was about a day's uh, distance apart. But that's how they did things back then. Also note that <coughs> they remind Jesus that Lazarus is someone whom he loves in verse 3. But the whole point is that Jesus says to them, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified by it. So no doubt, Martha and Mary, when they hear this, they are thinking Jesus is saying Lazarus won't die. But the problem is, he did in fact die. And not only that, but if you put the number of days together that are referred to in this passage, it is highly likely that Lazarus is already dead when the messenger gets back to them. And can you imagine the bewilderment that this must create in Martha? By the time the messenger gets there to assure them that Lazarus won't die, they have already suffered the torment of his death and burial. And to make matters worse, it appears that Jesus is intentionally delaying his coming to them. That leads us to the second section that I'm calling the procrastination. In verses 7 through 16, Jesus has an interesting conversation with his disciples. We're not going to go into that in detail, but it appears that Jesus' disciples 
have the exact opposite response from that of Mary and Martha. Whereas Mary and Martha are dumbfounded as to why Jesus has not come to them in Bethany, the disciples are wondering why in the world Jesus would even consider going to Bethany. And in an almost comical development here, Jesus tells them that Lazarus has fallen asleep and that he must go and wake him up. And they respond by saying, well, if he's just asleep, then he'll be okay. We don't need to go to Bethany because if we do, we're probably going to die there. But Jesus then has to tell them plainly, he's dead. At which point they say, well, okay, I guess we should go with him so we can die as well. But in the midst of that conversation, Jesus makes it clear that his disciples, that he is glad that he wasn't there to prevent Lazarus' death because Lazarus' resurrection four days later will greatly bolster their faith. And that is why he procrastinated for two more days because he knew what this would do in the lives of his followers. And that leads us thirdly to the premise. Verses 17 through 24, we see Jesus' arrival back in Bethany and his being met there by Martha. Now, this section is all about their grieving. When he arrives, he finds them weeping and mourning. And we even get the sense of their anguish and grief when John tells us in verse 35 that when Jesus saw how brokenhearted they were, he wept with them. And twice in this passage, John says that Jesus was greatly moved in his spirit as he felt in his humanity the anguish that death causes. But what I want you to notice is that three times in this text, we're told their premise. In verse 21, Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. In verse 32, Mary, who came out later, said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then down in verse 37, some of the Jewish people who had gathered to mourn with them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of him who was blind have kept this man from dying? The premise is clear. If Jesus had gotten there earlier, he could have prevented Lazarus' death. In fact, you almost get the idea here that Martha and later Mary meet Jesus with their hands on their hips as if they're saying, you've got a lot of explaining to do. They are totally bewildered by this turn of events. Why did Jesus say by way of messenger that he would not die? Was Jesus mistaken? Does his delay mean that he really does not love them? And couldn't Jesus have healed Lazarus from a distance as he had done on other occasions? How did this happen this way? But one thing they all agree on, if Jesus had been there sooner, Lazarus would not have died. And yet we all know from this text that this was all orchestrated and planned by Jesus for a specific purpose. We have all heard the expression, where there is life, there is hope. And we all know what that means. As long as a person is alive, there is always the hope of a cure or a miraculous recovery. But once the person dies, that hope is dashed, especially if they have been in the tomb for four days. 
But what our Lord is teaching us here is because of who he is, where there's death, there's hope. And he does it in this chapter in a very dramatic way by raising Lazarus from the dead after four days. Now, we know from this passage that Martha is not totally devoid of faith. In verse 22, she exclaims, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Now, she's probably not saying here that she is expecting that Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead, but she is at least expressing her continued faith in Christ. In verse 27, when Jesus asked her about what she believes, she says, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Martha was not without faith, but she had a very limited perspective. Her perspective was limited in a number of different ways. First of all, her perspective was limited in regard to time. She thought Jesus was too late. And her perspective was limited by space. She thought Jesus had to be there to prevent her brother from dying. Of course, she was wrong on both counts, and she failed to understand Jesus' purpose in all this. And I don't mean to be unduly critical of Martha here because I probably would have responded in much the same way, but her perspective seems to have been tempered by her own limited understanding of reality. And by the way, Martha's limited perspective is illustrated beautifully by baseball's Ty Cobb. Ty Cobb was always known for his positive perspective on life. So when he had reached the age of 70, a reporter asked him, what do you think your batting average would be if you were playing these days? Cobb, who was a lifetime 367 hitter, replied, about 290, maybe 300. And the reporter asked, well, is that because of the increased travel, the night games, the artificial turf, and all the new, new pitches? He said, no, it's because I'm 70. Now, admittedly, Ty Cobb is not being realistic about his ability to hit at age 70, but at least he wasn't in danger of limiting himself by having too small a perspective. I would submit to you that we often have the limited perspective of Martha instead. And what we believe Jesus can do is often limited by our own understanding or that which we can see in our own Uh, uh, with our own eyes. And that brings us to the heart of the passage. In verses 25 and 26, we see the proclamation. Backing up to verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother shall rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. This is another indication of her faith here. She believed in the ultimate resurrection of the dead on the last day. She had ultimate hope in the resurrection. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and and believes in me shall never die. Folks, this is one of the highest theological peaks in scripture. You know, it's probably not a good idea to rank the sayings of Jesus, but this has to be right at the very top. This is the fifth of the seven I am statements of Jesus, and all of them declare his uniqueness and deity. But this one declares that he has power over death. And that was 
then vividly demonstrated by his raising of Lazarus. Jesus' miracles were signs, and signs always point to something. His miracles were not done just to show that he had power or to entertain or impress. They were to demonstrate something important about who he was, the divine son of God. And this sign in particular (coughs) was to show that he had absolute power over death and the grave. It was necessary for Jesus to tarry so that there would be absolutely no question that Lazarus was dead. It was necessary then for Jesus to raise him from the dead after four days to demonstrate this amazing truth about himself. Verses 25 and 26 have been quoted at a million funerals and graveside services. It is the very bedrock of Christian hope in the face of death. These words have stood as a lighthouse in the midst of the darkness of death for centuries. Many have clung to these words as they themselves have come to the hour of death. And the truth of the matter is that death has spread its slimy fingers over our world from Adam right down to the present day. And like many others, I have stood beside many graves and seen the heartbreak and anguish that death brings. I have stood beside the beds of those who were breathing their last breath. And only in the case of those whose faith is fastened upon these words of Jesus have I ever seen peace at the hour of death. Only among those who have fixed their hope on the one who is the resurrection and the life, have I seen victory in death. But notice that Jesus does not just offer resurrection and life. He is the resurrection and the life. And if you are in Christ by having placed your faith in him for salvation, then you too will experience resurrection, and eternal life. Jesus said in John 14, 19, because I live, you shall live also. And in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul wrote, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection from the dead. For as as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, after that those who are Christ's at his coming. Because he is the resurrection and the life, all those who are in Christ will be raised to eternal life. And notice this speaks not only of resurrection, but also of life, true life, eternal life, abundant life. In fact, the emphasis of this statement is on the word life. That is a word that was very critical to the apostle John. He used that word more than 40 times in his gospel. And it always means something far greater than mere physical life. But look at that statement again. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Ray Stedman writes, there's great mystery in those words. I do not think that anyone can fully understand them. Indeed, they sound a bit contradictory. How can Jesus say if he dies and at the same time say he shall never die? Well, what the Lord seems to indicate is that death can come and still not really be death. In other words, for a person who is in Christ Jesus, death 
is not really death. As Paul would later say, it has lost its sting. It has no power anymore. John MacArthur says, Jesus' two statements are not redundant. They teach separate, though related truths. The one who believes in Jesus will live even if he dies physically because he will raise him up on the last day. And since everyone who lives and believes in him has eternal life, they will never die spiritually since eternal life can never be extinguished by physical death. And this brings us now to the last point in our outline, which is the point, the point. What is the point of this account? Notice the question for Martha at the end of that incredible statement. Do you believe this? That is the question all of us must ask and understand something. When Jesus was asking her this question. He was not asking her if she believed that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He was asking her if she believed that he alone was the source of resurrection and eternal life. Linsky says to believe this is to believe what he says of himself and thus to believe in him. Because of his great love for Martha, Jesus pointed her to the only source of resurrection and eternal life, himself. The Bible is absolutely clear. Jesus Christ is the only way to eternal life. He is the door by which every man must enter. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. In John 20, 31, John gives the purpose for the writing of his gospel. And he says, these things have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. He is, of course, speaking to people here who already have physical life. So it is obvious what he's speaking of is something greater than that. It is eternal life, and that only comes from believing in Jesus Christ. Now we know from Martha's response in verse 27 that she did, in fact, have that that kind of saving faith. Look at it again. She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. This is Martha's profession of faith (coughs) in which she acknowledged the deity of Christ, that he is the Lord's Messiah, that he is the one who has been sent by God as the Savior of the world. In fact, Martha's affirmation here stands with all the other great statements of faith recorded in the New Testament. It stands with that of the Apostle Peter who said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the question that Jesus asked Martha is the greatest question any of us can ever ask. Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Do you believe that he is the one who was sent by God as the one and only Savior of the world? That's the point of all this. That's why we have this account in our Bibles. This is not just a neat story about someone coming out of the grave after four days. It is a historical event that points to the truth of who Jesus is and the power he has to give us everlasting life. The raising of Lazarus was a sign. All but the greatest sign is yet to come. The raising of Lazarus was a prelude to the great resurrection of the saints at the end of time. 
There is coming a great Easter morning for all of us who are in Christ Jesus. The Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first and then those who are still alive when he comes will be caught up together with him in the clouds and so we shall forever be with him. Men say where there is life, there is hope, but we can say where there is death, there is hope. And listen, this hope gives us the confidence to face any kind of fear. It puts the problems of this life in perspective. There is no circumstance too dark. There is no sorrow too deep that this truth cannot heal. And the fact that Jesus has power over death means that we can trust him with 10,000 other cares in this life. Biblical faith is always resurrection faith. It trusts God to raise the dead, and it trusts in God for everything in this life. In fact, our resurrection will be much greater than that of Lazarus. He eventually died again, but we will be raised incorruptible, never to die again. That is what we celebrate today. He is the resurrection and the life. Anyone who puts his faith in him will live even if he dies. And anyone who believes in him will never, ever die. Do you believe this? Let's pray together. Father, I ask this morning by your Holy Spirit, that you would just make this truth so clear. Lord, that every person here would know the truth of your word, the truth of your gospel, what Jesus accomplished on the cross and with the resurrection, who he is as the resurrection and the life. And Lord, I pray that if anyone here today has never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, that they would do that this morning. And that all of us who are believers, that we would know how important it is that we be about your work, faithful to your church, faithful in service to you, faithful with our witness in a world that so desperately needs to hear the message of your word. And Lord, I pray that you would now inspire our hearts and challenge us and convict us and help us to respond to your word the way you'd want us to. And Lord, we especially pray for those that don't know you, that, that they would come to know you this morning. That's what this is all about. And Lord, we celebrate the resurrection every Lord's day, but this day in particular, what an awesome day that would be for someone to come to faith in Christ. And Lord, I pray that they would come to you today and, and humbly repent and turn to you in saving faith. So Lord, I pray now that you would help us as we respond to you, to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>